So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Telegraph Extra event um, with, in partnership with HarperCollins, uh, Lord Archer's publishers. Uh, we are here this evening to talk about his new book, Over My Dead Body. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to do a couple of uh, technical details. I want to say hello to all the... Um, I'm looking at the camera at the back as if that's where I'm meant to look, but there are cameras everywhere, so I'll look everywhere. Welcome to the Telegraph su subscribers, because this is an event uh, for Telegraph subscribers. Welcome to you all, whether you're at home or we're sitting here in the, in the headquarters, the pulsing headquarters of the Telegraph here. You can hear the typewriters clattering outside the door. No, obviously not, but they are just out there. Tomorrow's paper is being prepared. Um, for those of you who are watching online or, or watching us from your homes, two technical things. You can see how technical I am already because I can't hold the microphone properly. But two technical things to share with you. One is if you want to watch it on full screen, you click the, bo the box in the bottom right-hand corner and you can see us in even more detail, uh, which, which will be a blessing. And, um, and the second thing is, if you've got any questions, scroll down on the question and answer um, uh, bar at the bottom, and you will send your questions through to my colleague Debbie, who will beam them through. Beam me up, Scotty. Beam them through to this iPad here, and we will join in. And ladies and gentlemen here in the audience, um, Debbie will have a microphone and come round. So if you're going to ask a question, wait till the microphone's with you and then we will we'll have time to answer some questions at that stage. So um, I hope that's all the housekeeping done. Yes, I'm getting a nod. That's very good. Don't fascinating. Want... i tell you why it's <laughs> fascinating. I was once sitting in an audience like this, listening to Bill Clinton, and uh, I noticed that he did this, the entire thing. So the people there never actually saw his face because he was, of course talking to the millions out there on television, and he was dismissing us, the poor people who'd taken the trouble to go and see him. And he literally, and he didn't even look at the interviewer. <laughs> That's very rude. We will not be doing that. We will not be doing and that. And we've actually got three cameras to look at all the time. <laughs> Bill. Uh, we will not be Bill and Hillary this evening sitting on the stage. I'm definitely not Hillary. Um, right. Um, the, the, I suppose the first thing we, we, we were talking before, and this is, this is something... Uh, I've, I've interviewed uh, Lord Archer. Uh, Jeffrey. 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 OK, Jeffrey. Uh, lots of times to the Telegraph. I'm, actually, I should say who I am, wouldn't I? That's a really good sign. So my name's Peter Stanford. I'm one of the feature writers here at the Telegraph. And it's been my pleasure to interview uh, Jeffrey Archer uh, in the past. Your, your, your novels, we, we were talking before, the process of you writing them is, 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 is long. I think because they, they come out relatively often, I think people don't realise the, the number, of, a number of drafts you go through. I've actually got something new to say about this for the first time in years. <laughs> because I was, I did a, I'm an auctioneer by, for my hobby. I do charity auctioneering as my hobby. And the last one I did last week was for the Royal Marines. And I sat next to the Commandant General. And he told me that his father was a pharmacist, but had secretly always wanted to be an author. Now, I've heard this before, of course, in different guises. But what shook me on this occasion, he's had six books published. And not one of them, in his opinion, had been a success. And I thought, you know, how many people would write six books and still go on if, if they literally want a success? Because picking up your question, Peter, it's 14 drafts for me. It's a thousand hours. Every word is handwritten. And if I'd written six books and not one of them had been a success, I have to say to you, I think I'd have given up about at number three and gone and been an estate agent or whatever was available to do. And I really admired him. I've sent him, a, I've sent him the short, the long and the tall with a, short, with a note saying, I truly admire you writing six novels because, frankly, that's probably 6,000 hours of work. And is the process, or do you, is, is 14 always the number? Do some take 16, some take 12? How yeah, you're right. I mean, truth is, when you're down to only putting in one sentence every 20 pages, 
and one word or two words. I mean, I woke up in the middle of the night a couple of, couple of nights ago and thought of a better word and went to, straight to my desk, crossed out the one, put it in. So when you are that, when you've reached that stage, frankly, it's time for you to give it to, uh, give it to the publisher. You're there. But the difference between the first and the second draft will be like a spider going across the paper. And even at about the, I, uh, I'm just doing something which will horrify you for the Daily Mail. <gasps> and, oh, did I say it? I'm just doing some, something for them. And uh, I swear to you, the best sentence in the thing I'm doing for them came on the 11th draft. Because when you start moving through it quickly, that's when a good, really, something really exciting happens. But if you're still fighting with it, I, I think of it like a sculpture, you know, the putty and then the clay and then the, then you go, it's, it's a long process. And I say to young people, uh, please, please, go to the ballet. And they say, what are you talking about, Geoffrey? To go to the ballet. Sit in the Royal Opera House and see the prima ballerina. And imagine how long and how many hours she's done to be the prima ballerina. Then look behind and see the chorus. And imagine how many hours they've spent just getting on the stage. And then think about the thousands of young women who would love to be on the stage, but don't make it. Why would it be different for someone who wants to be number one on the New York Times bestsellers list? It's just as difficult. It's just as difficult if you're a painter. It's just as difficult if you play the violin. There's no shortcut. And after 40 years, I think I probably am a better craftsman. But it still takes the same amount of time. You, you said then about if you want to be on the, on the New York Times bestsellers list, and indeed your, your books of, I think 27 of them have been number one bestsellers. It's another newspaper, I don't know if I can mention it. I'd say the Sunday Times really quietly. Um, but on the Sunday Times bestsellers list, I mean, did you always know you wanted, did, did you feel that in writing novels you wanted them to be bestsellers? I mean, was it, was it the aim or was it, a, was it a bonus? No, I didn't want to sell any at all. No, you know what I mean. <laughs> I... I, I one of the things I'm most proud of, and it arises in this, in this question, is that I ran for my country. Now, you don't get to run for your country unless you're a competitor. So I'm a competitor at anything I do. I remember, some of you just may be old enough to remember the great Lynn Davis, who won an Olympic gold medal for the long jump. And his biggest rival was a man called Terra Ovenesian, who was the great Russian jumper. And indeed, they got the gold and silver in the Olympics. But I swear to you, I witnessed them at an international meeting, watching a snail, two snails climb up a wall, and one took the side of one snail, and one uh, prompting them on. They couldn't stop. They were just natural competitors. And I suspect I'm a natural competitor. So yes, do I want to be number one on the New York Times? Yes, please. OK. OK, I, I must, I must uh, tune my, my, my mind to, to that, as, as, as opposed to what I said before. Um, the thing that just struck me then when you were talking was getting up in the middle of the, the, middle of the night to change one word. Mm. I mean, that, that's such dedication, that's such energy and commitment to it. I'm not suggesting you, you look exactly the same as uh, last time I saw you, but we're, we're all getting a little bit older. Does, does, that, does there come a moment when you think that that enthusiasm, that complete drive that you have, Will, will not still be there? Well, I'm, I'm 81 years old, and so I naturally wonder, will there come a point when I say, stuff this? Truth is, I haven't needed to write since Cain and Abel. That book still sells a quarter of a million copies every year. Wow. So I haven't needed to write. So I don't write for anything. And I'm not here in the Telegraph today because you're paying me a vast sum to be with you, Peter. <laughs> I, me personally, obviously. <laughs> So no, the answer to your question is I do it because I love it. I love writing. I love the process. I love the job. And yes, I love the results. And if suddenly, and, and we've all seen this with authors, I, suddenly the public said, no, we've had enough of you. Yeah, I would uh, go back to wanting to be captain of the England cricket team. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, well, they're not, they're not near to doing that. So it's, it's 295 million books. Do you know the publishers publish it? They must know. They must know. I'm sure that, I'm sure that was the figure I, I was given, which is extraordinary. Anyway, the book we're talking about today is Over My Dead Body, which is the fourth of your William Warwick series. So where, where is... Will, William has been climbing the ranks, hasn't he, through the Metropolitan Police. Yes, where absolutely. is he up to now in the new one? He's a chief inspector. That's very good. But he, uh, when I wrote this, I didn't want it to be a detective story when I started this. I wanted it to be a story about a detective and there's a subtle difference. And it all arose from a series I'd written called The Clifton Chronicles, where Harry Clifton, the hero of, of the book, had uh, an eponymous hero called William Warwick. And I, and I got a lot of letters from readers saying, please, can you tell us more about William Warwick? So I decided I'd start him off uh, at school wanting to join the Metropolitan Police. And I would have uh, his father, Sir Julian, a QC, wanting him to go to Oxford and read law, but he defies his father and joins the Metropolitan Police on the beat as a constable. I then decided I would want him to hold all the ranks, so he'd go from constable to detective sergeant, detective inspector, and in this book, detective chief inspector, and then after detective chief inspector, he would become a superintendent, then a chief superintendent, then a commander, and then commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Now, I have no doubt, having read this book, that he is capable of becoming commissioner <laughs> of the Metropolitan Police. But I'm sorry to say, I will have to live till the age of 86 for him to make it. And, that, and I'm, that may be the bigger challenge. But I even rang my publisher last week and said, because it's eight books at the moment. And I said, I think I found a way of making it nine books, <laughs> possibly ten. And she said enthusiastically, how? <laughs> so I said, well, we could have him demoted in one book. <laughs> Then he'll go down and have to go back up again. Oh. But I'll have to live to 90. <laughs> I, I want to talk about... I've got to ask you, what is the secret? What is, what is, what is the secret at 81? And being planning to write books till you're 90. Do you have a special elixir every morning? Or? I, think, I think I genuinely believe that energy is a gift. I don't think you can pop down to Marks and Spencer's and buy a packet of energy. There's nothing I can do about it. I mean, would it be more sensible to be able to stop it? <coughs> Possibly. But if you're born that way, you're stuck. And I've long believed that if you have energy and a talent, then you have a real chance. But if you have energy and no talent, you're still in the game. Energy is that important. Because if you have talent and no energy, you're finished. You won't go anywhere. And we've all met people like that. I, I remember at Oxford, there was a president of the union I was certain would be prime minister. And he did absolutely nothing. So you can, okay. can get that wrong. But, so, but the energy comes naturally. I mean, I'm, I just, I'm just hoping there's a, there's a special thing that I could drink each day and it would give me energy. No? No. I gen Mary's got it as well. My wife has got it. amazing energies. I'm, uh, as you probably know, she's currently chairman of the Science Museum having run Cambridge University Hospital. And it's a pleasure to, to watch her and think, wow, she actually works even harder than I do. And this, well, this is not being silly. I think we were both influenced by Margaret Thatcher. We watched her working year in and year out and thought, wow, that really, is. I mean, her hours were unbelievable and her dedication was, you may not agree with what she said, you may not even approve of what she did, but you couldn't miss the energy and the, the absolute dedication. Of course. OK. Now, in the book, um, I, uh, the, the, the William Warwick character who is, is, is developing, mm. um, is, is, what's, what's he, is, is, he based on, is he based on you? Nope. Is, nope, no, absolutely not. So he's got energy, though, hasn't he? He has, and he's based on a man called John Sutherland, who was a detective superintendent Chief, I'm sorry, Detective Chief Superintendent in the Metropolitan Police, and he had to leave the force. 
in very sad circumstances, he had a mental breakdown, which he described in his book as one murder too many. I've, I've rarely met a finer man. In fact, I, was, I went to Hatchard's quite recently to do a talk like this, and he was sitting there, and I gave an opening speech and then said, we'll take questions between us. We had 14 questions, 12 to him, two to me. They wanted to talk to a man whose integrity and honesty was not up for discussion on the subject of the Metropolitan Police. And he was quite brilliant. So it's based on him. So he gets to read about the sixth draft of the book. I have two. I have uh, John Sutherland, who's a, a detective chief superintendent, and Sergeant Michel Roycroft, who was in the drug squad for 25 years. And these two get the book on about the sixth draft, and they make sure I haven't made a fool of myself, because they can't do that, Jeffrey, but you could do that. And if you did that, you could get away with that. But you, because I always say to them, please let me get away with as much as I can. <laughs> and they try very hard to make sure I can. And occasionally, if, we get, if I get lucky, they give an anecdotal story about something that happened. They read a chapter and think, actually, I can remember when X happened. And that becomes anecdotal. I'll give you an example. John said to me one day, I said, you must have been tricky. You've just come down from university with a good degree. Your sister was teaching at Somerville College, Oxford. So you were actually, frankly, a bit of a snooty for the Metropolitan Police. And he said, no, you work hard. If you work hard, they don't notice. But he said, that one of, I said, they must have teased you. And he said, yeah, they used to, they used to tease me. One of the teases was I, I came in one, one day and the desk sergeant said, uh, Sutherland, Sutherland, we've got a problem in cell number three. Take this prescription straight to Boots. Now, now. So John ran out of the building, ran all the way to the Boots. There was a queue at the dispensary, and he apologized. I'm so sorry, I've got a, a please. And he went straight to the front and gave it to the lady. And the lady opened it and read it, and she turned round, and she took down a packet of condoms. <laughs> and she gave it to him, and he went bright red. And he went out, and he read the note, and it said, it said, I am a young constable, and I found this rather nice girl, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I should do next. Can you help me? <laughs> now, those stories are, are gems, because you know they're true. You couldn't make them up. The secret is to get them into a story without announcing, I'm about to tell you a very funny story. Laugh and we'll move on. You've got to slip it in so the reader goes with you but stays with the main story and moves on. And I think, I mean, I've, if you met Michelle, I mean, she's a firecracker. She, uh, she's a blonde. Uh, she'd be, I'm guessing, 55 now. But she told me a story about an inspector putting a hand on her leg and she knocked him out with one punch. <laughs> and she said, it didn't help my career prospects. <laughs> <laughs> so you get things like that all the time. That you, you, you take them in and they kind of s slip into a book at the right moment. It's no use. I mean, you lose a lot because they don't fit in. But... They give you these lovely gems, and then you've got to find the moment where they fit in. There are elements, though, of William Warwick, aren't there, that are that are that reflect some of your own interests. I mean, this in this new novel, um, a lot of it. Well, it, it 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 was there in the previous one as well. It's around fine art, and it's a Caravaggio, a Vermeer, and you are a, 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 a great connoisseur of the arts. No, I'm not a connoisseur, but I am a collector. Okay. I'm not clever enough to be a connoisseur. I'm leaving you to go and have dinner with a connoisseur, Chris Beatles, who really is. What's the difference between a collector and a connoisseur? I think you claim to have some scholarship if you're a scholar. Okay. I love, I've been collecting all my life, and I love it. And I say to young authors when they come to see me, write about what you know about. I love art. I do charity auctioneering. I love politics. I'm quite interested in big business, and I'm... And, and I like, as you said earlier, trying to be number one. Get all those things into a book, and the person will feel you know what you're talking about. And this lady came to see me, and she said, oh, it's not fair, Jeffrey. I said, what do you mean it's not fair? She said, well, I mean, you've met so many interesting people, and you've had such a fascinating life. How can I hope to compete with you? I said, what do you do? 
And she said, I'm a hairdresser. I said, you get more stories in one day <laughs> in a hairdresser than I'll get in a year. <laughs> And the, so reading it, the other, the other character who, who, who sort of had a resonance for me was um, William Windsor's wife, Beth, who is, uh, a, who's an art historian at a, a, a museum in London, very involved in all of that, seems rather sort of cool and clever and sophisticated. And could it be Mary? Could it be Mary? There we are. You've, <laughs> I'm putting it as delicately as I could. You've got it straight away. <laughs> Again... You, I've lived with Mary now for 55 years. I was an uneducated man when I met her. I'm now very well educated. You can't live with Mary Archer for 55 years and not be well educated. So, yes, it's easy to write about her because I watch her, I watch the way she works, I see how she's different to me, how she uses that amazing brain, and so I put it into the book. And... Uh, of course, my friends see it as Mary very clearly. They read the book and say, <laughs> and I like strong women. I had a very strong mother who took her degree at the age of 53 and became a local councillor at Western Supermare. I worked 11 years for Margaret Thatcher, and I'm married to Mary Archer, so I believe passionately in strong women. I mean, I will tell you one fact which I think is disgraceful. Disgraceful. Mary was the first woman ever to chair a national museum or gallery. Frankly, by the year 2020, she should have been the 30th woman to chair a national gallery or museum. But the truth is, she's the first. Does, when, you, when you say your friends uh, recognise Mary in, in the character of Beth, does Mary recognise Mary and Beth? She sometimes makes comments. <laughs> nice ones? She sometimes <laughs> adds. I, I'm not a natural... I'm not a natural... She's not a natural reader for me. Right. And I must warn any of you who have been thinking about writing books, don't assume your husband, your wife, your partner, your best friend is a natural reader for you. Mary loves Proust. OK. She, I, I, we share Shakespeare, but she Proust. loves Proust. In fact, I would say to anyone, if you've written a book, don't show it to your husband or wife. They'll lie. <laughs> don't show it to your best friend. He'll lie. What are they going to say? This is rubbish. No, they're going to say, wonderful. Wonderful. What you should do is give the book to a friend you trust. Ask him to get with no name on it. Ask him to show it to someone who's never met you and get them to write a one-page written report you might just get the truth then. Because I cannot tell you how many people have said, I'm sorry to bother you, Jeffrey, but my husband tells me I have written a masterpiece. Yes. <laughs> it's not a good it's opening good sentence. Good. I'm, but I'm wondering, listening to you, are you telling us that Mary doesn't read your novels then? Mary reads them at about the 18th draft. But you said she, there were only 14 just before. Yes, <laughs> no, after they come back from the public. OK, OK. <laughs> Literally, when it's that tense. OK. She, she reads this. Right. When there's still the opportunity... To change. ..to change a comma right. or a full stop. Right. So she reads literally the last draft uh, and, and does point out things that are grammatically incorrect or a comma in, in inverted um, apostrophes. She's big on apostrophes. Right. Because uh, she good. knows where they should be. Right. She's very good on that. Uh, but no, I'm, I, I, I've got one son who would be at the bookshop the day the book came out. Right. And I've got one son who, frankly, is almost forced into reading me. Right. But that's fair enough You to, to live with that. I mean, I can think of authors that are recommended to me that I, that I would never give. I would never... Na na I can think of some very great authors who I'm not a natural for. I mean, I, read a, I try to read a book a week. I'm, I'm reading a fascinating book at the moment. I try to read a book a week, but there are some of them, I, I don't know about you, but there are some I give up about page 30. I think, I, you know, at 81, have I really got? <laughs> because the most flattering thing for an author is that you've read the book, because very few people can read it in under two days, and very few people can read it in under eight hours. It's not like watching a 30-minute thing on television. Yeah. It's not like reading an article written by Peter. You're, if you're committed to read this, 
will take you six, eight, six hours. And so any author, I would say to any author, you should be very flattered that someone has taken that much trouble. Yes. Um, obviously, John, we don't, we don't do quite so many drafts. I was very impressed by you said you did 11 drafts for your Daily Mail article. You, if, well, I, yeah, not, not, not to give away, obviously, in the Telegraph building, how many drafts are normally done. But, no, um, I, but the, <laughs> the, I suppose journalists are so... I mean, I've, you will know far better than I do, Peter, that the editor rings you up and says, I need a 1,000 words on this by tonight. Mm. What's tonight? 6 o'clock, mm. 5 o'clock preferably. And what is it? It's 10 o'clock in the morning. And it may not even be a subject on which you're a world expert. But you've got, to deliver, the thought, obviously. <laughs> you've got to deliver a thousand words. I could not do that. I, I, w I could deliver the thousand words, but it would take me a week to get it where I wanted it. I, 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 I once wrote, uh, the biggest challenge I ever had at that level was the, the, the Reader's Digest rang me and said, we want you to write a hundred word story. Fine, I said. And they said, no, not quite as easy as that, Jeffrey. We want you to write, it can't be 101 words, it can't be 99 words. It must have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we want it by this time tomorrow. You've got 24 hours. Well, I didn't sleep that night. I literally didn't sleep that night. I, w I did the 100-word story. I wrote the 100-word story, and I got it in just on time. I wish I had it here to put it up on the screen for you. Uh, but I did write it and finished it. And that took me 24 hours, 100 words. So journalists, Peter will tell you, that. Well, you rang the other day about something at Grantchester. I did. Uh, how many words was that? That was 2,500. That, that was a longer and one. And how long were you given? Oh, they gave, gave you a bit longer for that. They're yeah. kind of. Three and a half thousand on, on a subject on which Peter rang and said, could you tell us about X and Y or do you know someone? And I thought, I just couldn't do that. I think, I think, you're, I think, you're, I think you're being very nice. No. Um, and, uh, but, um, um, yes, so we, let, let, back to the novel. Um, uh, Miles For Faulkner, Miles, Miles Faulkner. Faulkner, who was dead at the end last time. I'm sure lots of people are kind of indeed are rather fascinated by, by that character. Someone once, I read one of the, um, the, the reviews of your last book where they described him as Moriarty to your um, oh, Sherlock to Holmes. William. To William Sherlock. Moriarty William. is a piece of genius, isn't he? Mm. Yeah, it's very flattering. Which I thought was quite a, ni a nice way of putting flattering. it. He is yeah. rather a fascinating character, isn't he? Well, uh, my crook is good looking, mm. uh, very wealthy, 50 years old, 45, 50, loves art, and so he's not a sort of broken-nosed, big-eared oaf. He's a very sophisticated, intelligent man. And uh, uh, Mary always says that uh, villains are much more interesting than uh, good people in books. People, Because I get more letters about Miles Faulkner, or as many as I do about William. And indeed, in the Clifton Chronicles, The Wicked Virginia... I mean, I was going to kill off the wicked Virginia until, until my publisher said, don't be stupid, they love her. And she was a really wicked woman. So, so reader power works. So those of you who are reading out there, you can, you can, you can, you can influence the author by, by writing in. Oh, well, yes. yes. Well, no, you, you, you're bound to influence the author. If you, if you, I remember the, a, 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 a a journalist from the BBC once telling me, if the BBC get five letters, it influences them. I thought it would be 5,000. I said, what? He said, if we get five letters on one subject, we look at it. If we get 10, 15, or 20, Gosh. it's getting serious. Gosh, well, you, you heard it here, everyone. There's a, there's a way of writing yeah, it. Yeah, and How so, many... yes, when I get five, 10, or 15 letters on one subject, yeah, I take it That's seriously. That's enough. I take, oh, yes. Gosh, oh, yeah. when you when you do you always know what the end is? I mean, obviously, that there's, there's, there's the question of the the end of the eight or now nine books in in the chronicle, or ten or, or ten or eleven. So I was going to ask if you knew what the end is, but the end obviously is moving. But in 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 a novel itself, when you start, some writers say that they know where they got to get to in the end. Are you one of those? I haven't got a clue. Pick up the pen at six o'clock in the morning. I rise at five thirty, start at six, do two hours from six to eight. That's the first run at it. And uh, 
sometimes when I'm walk, walking to my office, which is 100 yards away, I still don't know what the first line will be, or I still don't know where I'm going. And I'll give you an example. I decided to kill off the wicked Virginia. I decided to put her in a court case against the wonderful Emma, the good, kind, and wonderful Emma, and the QC, who was a good chap, would absolutely slaughter her. Now, this was decided before I got up, and I was all ready. And the, the scene that morning that I was going to write was, a, was the court case. And she was got into the witness box, and I got I was ready, and I wrote the first sentence that the QC shot at her, and she just tossed it aside. So I looked at the paper and thought, oh, I'll try another one, and I put in another second I thought tougher, and she just tossed it aside. Three pages later, she'd won the case. So you can't always know where you're going, and I had to think the direction I was going after that because she'd won the case. And indeed, in that book, she does win the case, and, and Emma loses, and you move on. And that's not a bad thing either. Let the pen go where it doesn't want to. I remember once, many years ago, um, I wrote a book called As the Crow Flies, uh, and it was based loosely on the great Jack Cohen, who'd founded Tesco and, and was a dear friend. And I'd spent a long time with him learning how he'd gone from the back streets of uh, the East End of London to running one of the great food empires on earth. And during the story, nothing to do with Jack, during the story, I had my hero, Alfie Trumper, uh, having to go to Australia to get in touch with a lady who knew the answer to the problem he was facing. And once he'd got the answer to the problem, he could deal with it. So I put him on a plane, got him to Australia, uh, got him to the place where this old lady was living in a care home. He knocks on the door. A Scottish lady answers the door. A matronly Scottish lady answers the door. And he says, I want to speak to Mrs. Pembleton. And, and, he, and, and she says, well, I'm very sorry. You clearly haven't heard that she died last week. Now, if you do that in a book, you can have a choice. You can put the line through it and go and find her and sort the problem out. Or you can face the fact, as the great Corlees Smith, the editor of J.D. Salinger, told me, or you can work it out, Jeffrey, because the reader will wonder how the hell you can. So I left it on there. And I walked around, I walked around a golf course that was quite near me, hour after hour. And it took me four, I've never had writer's block because this wasn't writer's block. This was a problem. And after four days, I got the answer. He knocks on the door. He says to the matronly lady, can I speak to Mrs. Pemberton? He, she says, you obviously don't know that she just died. And he says, he's, he's broken, he's finished. He's come on, he's, his career is finished, life's, he turns to go and she said, are you going back to England? And he says, uh, yes, I am. Oh. I've got a letter I need posted. It'll save me so much if I don't. And in the letter is everything he needs to know. That took three days. Does it take, do, 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 some writers talk about characters taking on a life of their own. Mm. And do you, do, you, do you find that happens with yours? Yes, I think I, th I accept that. But, but it's and I accept they live with you too. They become real. And people stop you in the streets and discuss them as if they've actually got a house and live somewhere. And you say, <laughs> no, they don't. Actually, it's a book. No, no, Jeffrey. No. <laughs> in talking of books, you've, um, as, as well as, as, well as uh, uh, this extraordinary energy and, and working through uh, the William Warwick series, you've also just started doing a podcast. You're, you're getting into the kind of modern, modern age of called Unput Downable, which is, which is a good metaphor for your books. It's... Some might say it's a little bit about you as well, with all your energy, which is good. Um, but you, and I, as I understand it in that, you talk to different authors, writers, performers mm -hmm. about a favourite book and a favourite cultural item in each and one. And they can pick anything. They can they pick can, art, music, yep. okay. the theatre, yep. television, anything they like. And I've had, uh, I, I did Barry Humphreys last week, who, by the way, because you may need to know poor things, I asked him how Dame Edna was. And he said she couldn't get back into Australia. 
and they told her if she did, they wouldn't be letting her out. <laughs> <laughs> so COVID has obviously hit her. So uh, it's been a fascinating experience for someone who has no technical skill at all to sit with real pros like these guys here and do the whole thing. Uh, and it's, it's an, another skill to learn. And I confess, I don't think I'm very good at it. I don't think I'm, I'm a natural. It's been enjoyable meeting some of the nation's leading entertainers and writers. Of course it has. And learning from them. Of course it has. But uh, we finished now. I think we've done eight and, and we've done them. And there's some very interesting authors and Tim Rice last week. He was, I was fascinating. I was wondering, given the choice, and you, you mentioned Mary reading Proust before, which, which, which was your one book, that you, that your, your unforgettable book, unputdownable book? Well, of course, I had to choose it eight times. OK, but of, of the eight, which would it be? Of the eight. Unquestionably, Stefan Zweig, uh, Beware of Pity. I think Stefan Zweig is a genius, was a genius. He sadly died. He committed suicide after leaving Austria when he thought Hitler was going to win the war. Uh, he wrote Beware of Pity in New York. It went straight to number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. He then fell out of favor. I've never understood why. And now the Pushkin Press have brought him back, and he's doing very well. But Beware of Pity is his masterpiece. And for those of you who love nonfiction, he wrote a book about the years leading up to Hitler, which is the best I've ever read on that subject. He, his, he, has, his, he has that rare combination of being a great writer and a great storyteller. He can do both. The beginning of uh, Beware of Pity, uh, I came to the dinner party. I was a little late. I sat opposite him. And because it was a circular table, I was unable to speak to him. Of course, everyone in the room knew who he was. He was a national hero. And I had hoped that we might speak to each other. When I left, I was putting on my coat, and he said, I wonder if I might join you while you walk home. Of course, sir. It would be an honor. And we walked out onto the street and along the pavement. And he said, you probably think you know my story. Of course I do, sir. Everyone does. No one does. But it's time I told someone the truth. What an opening. Gosh, I think we all need to go what off and read opening. that now, if we haven't already. Yes. And just quickly, because we must do some audience questions, what was your cultural object? Of your, the your, first one? Yes, or, or your, your best of eight? all the ones yes. I chose. It would either be Benini's, Benini's Christ on the Cross, or it would be Caravaggio's, and I'm not a religious person, it would either be that or Caravaggio's Judas in the Garden. I think probably Caravaggio's Judas in the Garden is just staggering. It's just staggering. Okay, good to know, good to know. Now, it is question time. I'm holding this rather nervously to one side because I heard it buzz as soon as it went anywhere near the, um, the, uh, the box. Um, so... All you do is wave at them and say which one of you them. wants to answer well, let, the question. Well, let's, well, we can, let's start with our, our external audience. Oh, and then, and then the we external will, we'll, audience. Just to show you, you're, you're being technical. I'm going to be a little bit technical now. So our first question uh, comes from Martin. Hello, Martin, as we look around at the cameras, like Bill Clinton. Do you believe there are people who are completely honest? And have you ever thought while writing that any of your characters fit this category? Completely honest. Completely honest. Well, I've never met a human being who is completely honest. Uh, I'll tell you, my wife, who's the nearest I've seen, even she, mind you, the worst example, uh, 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 this name won't mean anything to you, but many, many years ago when we were children, we just got married and we were in Rome. I said, let's go to the Hilton Hotel and buy a Coca-Cola and sit by the pool because we couldn't afford to get to the beach. We couldn't afford to hire a car. So we go up to the pool and we sit at the pool and, and order, a, order a, a Diet Coke. And uh, next to me is a young man of about my age. And uh, we got chatting about what we were going to do. And he, I said, what are you? He said, I'm a clapperboard boy. 
on the last picture show, if you remember that film. None of you old enough. And over, this other end, over there is Peter Bogdanovich, and I'm working. I said, what are you going to do when, you know, where are you heading? I want to be a producer, he said. Oh, I said. And he said, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be prime minister. Why don't we keep in touch and see which one of us gets there first? Well, I said, what is a producer? And he said, a producer is someone where the whole screen says his name. I mean, you'll bet you've seen it today in modern television and films. 18 producers, even before <laughs> you get to any... Uh, no, he said, the whole screen. So he gets the whole screen. You'll come to the honesty bit in a moment. And he, his name is Frank Marshall. And he flew over to another film he was doing, and we had dinner with him. And he described this film he'd just done. And he had opening night seats for us at the Empire Theatre in Leicester Square. And, and Mary, he said, I'll join you. And Mary said to me, this is her honesty, I can't go. And I said, why? She said, I've never heard a bigger load of drivel <laughs> in my life. It will be the biggest failure. And he said, she said, I love Frank. You love Frank. You go. So he rang up and said, I can't make it. Frank rang up and said, I can't make it. So Mary said, I can go. There was uh, a standing ovation in the first, admittedly it was opening night, in the first five minutes. And there was cheering throughout the film. Uh, when Harrison Ford goes in with all the spiders, or whatever he went into, into the cave, you remember that opening. And then, but I have to tell you, when that was described to Mary and myself, before we'd seen it, we both thought it was bonkers. And of course it went on to win an Oscar and he became <laughs> famous and we love him because I didn't get anywhere near being prime minister. He's now been nominated eight times for Oscars and we remain very close friends. When you say you didn't get anywhere near being prime minister, would that, was, that one of your, was that one of your ambitions? Well, I preferred to have kept in the England cricket team. Okay. That would have been really... Num that was number yes. one. I'd like to, number one, I'd like to have kept in. And then I'd love to have scored a century at Lords with an elegance and ease. Uh, you know these people who have the, the eye coordination, so they hit a ball. Uh, I don't. It's either gone past me or I haven't seen it at all. And I love, uh, those of you who can remember David Gower, I would love the way he just did that and the ball went to the boundary. I always found that incredibly tiresome because I would love to have done it just once. <laughs> And this, this follows on from that in a way. Uh, this is Nigel. Hello, Nigel. Nigel is asking, do you have any unrealised ambition in life? Well, do you know, if I could do anything, because of the, we all have dreams, I'd be a barroom singer. <laughs> I saw Sinatra singing. We, we've got the microphone here, Geoffrey. If you, yeah, if you, I'd like, be a barroom I, singer. I can I hum I and you can sing. go. No, no, I meant it. <laughs> I meant it. I saw Sinatra singing... Uh, in Vegas mm, 50 years ago and it was devastating and the, the pros tell me he didn't have a very strong voice which is why perhaps the Albert Hall was not the ideal venue for him but if you saw him doing his thing in, in, a, in a cellar wow wow and, and I realized what a pro he was. I, I, I met him later in life and went to see him doing a rehearsal. And he was doing a rehearsal for uh, a big charity concert that I was involved in. And I watched him do something on the night. And I, I, people gasped at the way he did it. But I'd watched him practicing it. He came from the back of the stage, right back there, through the orchestra. Imagine yourself to be the orchestra. He came through the orchestra. And uh, Grace Kelly was sitting up in the stand, up in the box there. She was the guest of honor. And uh, Al Francis Albert Sinatra comes through, and he chats to a violinist, and then he chats to a trumpeter. And then someone recognizes him, and the, the applause begins. He knew exactly what he was doing. And then when he got here, by the time he got here, they were, they were cheering, it, it brilliant. Mind you, I'd watched him practicing it to a split second. <laughs> he, then took, he took the microphone out like that, and he walked to where she was sitting, and looked. he didn't look at the audience, but he could hear as 
the cheering and applause went down, he made sure he arrived at the box at that moment and said, you make me feel so young. And then the whole place went up more, again. More, 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 more. But I'd watched, <laughs> I'd watched him do this whole thing. It was time to, and what it taught me, what it taught me in my young age, is you, if you're gonna want to be number one, you'd better put the work in. He didn't casually come through that orchestra. He didn't casually chat to the people he was, he got the whole thing down to a split second so that when he came back to start singing, the audience were already on his side. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Listen to them. I, Debbie's got the microphone now. Is it anyone, anyone here in our pulsating headquarters like to ask a question? The gentleman at the back there. From a personal perspective, is your most recent novel... I'll have to repeat it, because I'm I will. so deaf. Yeah, I can hear it, it's OK. Sorry. From, your, from a personal perspective, is your most recent novel always your best novel? And if it's not, which one was? From a personal perspective, is your, is your latest novel always your favourite novel or your best novel? And if, if this one isn't, which one is? Yes, I think authors have that weakness, <laughs> but no, it isn't. The public have decided that Cain and Abel is. It's now sold 37 million copies and been read by 100 million people. Who am I to argue? And it changed my whole life overnight, literally overnight. But I was in Hatchard six, 50 years ago when Peter Giddy ran Hatchard's, wonderful man. And Cain and Abel was number one right across the world. And he said, well done, Geoffrey. It's, it's a good book, I enjoyed it, well done. I thought, this is a bit dull. And he said, but you'll never write Not A Penny More, Not A Penny Less again. And he thought that was the best thing I'd ever done. Uh, and he was an old pro. But the public have decided Cain and Abel. I'm sentimental about Paths of Glory. The idea of whether Mallory did reach the top of Everest, or whether when they found his body 700 foot from the top, was he on his way up? or one is on his way down. And I talked to Sir Christopher Bonington about this, and he said it doesn't matter. I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? He said, uh, frankly, Geoffrey, he was the greatest climber that ever lived. He didn't know where the top was. He had four attempts at it. Each time he got lost or anything. Nowadays, he said, there are signposts all the way up to the top. <laughs> he said, this man was a genius. And so I talked to, uh, the 700 feet was a problem for me because I've never climbed. And I, I, I saw Bear Grylls, and I sat him down and said, right, young man, take me from 700 foot to the top. And he talked for an hour about going up the 700 foot and coming back the 700 foot. So I had someone who'd actually done it. And I, I'm sentimental about that book, although I'm proud to tell you, there's an awful lot of people who are kind about the short stories. A lot of people will write to me and say, I love your short stories. OK, we've got, uh, we've got one here, slightly intriguing one, um, from Bill, who is uh, one of our uh, subscribers looking in from their home. Um, rather blunt question, I'm afraid. It says, what's it like being so famous? <laughs> At one level, it's wonderful. Right. Absolutely thrilling, amazing and wonderful. At another level, it, it, it can be tiresome, but I think you'd be a fool to complain. I mean, someone said to me the other day when I was signing books for over an hour, don't you get bored with this? And I said, it must be very boring that nobody comes <laughs> and wants a book signed. No, thank you. I will, mind you, I, when I was a young man and written not a penny more, not a penny less, I went on tour with David Niven, who'd written a book called The Moon's a Balloon. And so off we went to the York race course. We then went across to Manchester. Then we, and it was the two of us. And we both spoke, and then people came for autographs. In, in, in Yorkshire, they, uh, there was a queue at the York race course. There were 300 people wanted his autograph, and two wanted mine. <laughs> so I know, what the other, I know what the other side is like. But, but, what, but, but in terms of the one, let's not do the negative, let's do the wonderful things. In terms of the wonderful things, does it mean doors swing open, things are possible that wouldn't be possible otherwise? 
It means a lady stopping you in the street and said, saying, he raised his hat. It was enough. And you know she's read every word of Cain and Abel several times. Just, it's, it's much more flattering to have a sentence, she only stopped screaming when she died. It was then that he started to scream. If they, if they said, I once saw Jack Lemmon in a, and I think he's probably the greatest film actor I've ever seen. If, if Alec Guinness isn't, I think Jack Lemmon is. And I saw him in a bar, and I wanted to tell him how wonderful he was, but I th thought he would probably be sick of someone saying, oh, God, you're the greatest, you're fantastic, you're wonderful. So I went up to him and said, that three minutes in the telephone box in Glengarry, Glen Ross, must have taken you 40 years to achieve. I thought he was going to burst into tears because I'd hit something. He knew that was true. For those of you who have seen Glengarry, Glen Ross, he's in a telephone box trying to sell land he doesn't own. And he's broke and broken. What a wonderful performance. And, and he knew that I'd spotted his years of work to be able to do that three minutes. Of course, of course. Um, I think, in terms of weaving things together, there's a gentleman over there who's just put his hand up. Um, Debbie's going to bring the microphone over. If you could... I will, I will do it, don't worry. It mumbling. Yeah. Lord Archer. Um, oh, I can hear you. When you reflect on your writing career, what would you say the best bit of feedback has been that you've received? Oh, thank you. Um, on when you reflect on your I writing apologize. career, what's, what's been the best bit of feedback you've received? An, an, an individual sentence or a statement where, I know this is nuts, but there's a lady in Australia who's read Cain and Abel 423 times. <laughs> she actually knows it far better than I do. She actually knows it off by heart. And sometimes if you've written a book 20 years ago, someone will come up and discuss some aspect of it and you can't remember because it was 20 years ago, and they look at you as if you never wrote it in the first place. I think uh, we shall not name him. Uh, I had a letter from a writer I'm totally in awe of who uh, said, I wish I could tell a story the way you do. And I'm in totally in awe of him. But to be fair, you know, despite the hard work, telling a story is a God-given gift. Don't kid yourself. You can't pop down to, to Marks and Spencer's and get a packet of stories. It's a God-given gift. Once upon a time, and off you go. And I, 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 I assume one day it will end. I assume he'll say one day, you've had enough, young man. I'm stopping you. So I'm, I'm very grateful and very aware that it is a gift. Very aware. We've got, we're going to, we've got time, I think, for one more question from our online audience. I'm getting a nod from, no, and nod from the, the organiser. Uh, and I found it, and now where's it gone? Oh, yes. Um, again, this is Steve Rusco. Thank you, Steve, for your question. Steve says, as a rule, your books are very British. Do you make any changes to them for the yeah, US market? That's a very that's good, good question. question, isn't it? That's a very yeah. good question. And I'll tell you about other markets in the world. You write, I write, you're quite right, I'm very British, I love my country, I'm sentimental, I'm romantic, and that's the way it is. And some people write about sex and violence and bad language, it's just not me. You have to pray that they will like it abroad. And I cannot explain to you in answer to Mr. Roscoe's question, I cannot explain why I go to number one on Der Spiegel in Germany and cannot do a damn thing in Spain. I do okay in France, but go to number one in Italy. I mean, if I could tell you, I, I deal with it. And I think it must be, this Britishness is very strange. The Indians buy me in droves because they love anything that's British. And don't forget, should you want to become a writer, 
There are 254 million people in India who speak English and read English. In fact, when I last came out, when I last was out, I love India, when I last was there uh, in Mumbai, and I came out of the, they, they take your book, they're very industrious, the Indians. They take my book at London Airport, they fly it over to India, they print it up, they've got it on the street at half price, 48 hours later. So I'm coming out, I'm in my car, cars pick me up, and there's a little boy with a pile of books. And he comes up and he taps on my window, so I wind the window down, he says, would you like the latest Jeffrey Archer? <laughs> and I said, I am the latest Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> Um, it's, that's a very good note to, to, to end on. We, um, just before we came on, Geoffrey showed me a photograph on his phone of himself at the Jaipur Literary Festival, um, where there was a crowd of thousands around you. It was like you were a rock star standing on, on the screen. It's been a slightly smaller group here uh, in the Telegraph, but, but it, 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 um, and you almost sang, so it was a bit like a rock concert. Um, and we'll, we'll develop that gift as we go forward. But listen, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, here in the audience. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, the around the country who've been uh, uh, joining us by um, the wonders of the internet. Oh, God, I'm dropping the microphone on the floor. And um, really, it's just uh, and for me to end by saying uh, thank you very much, Telegraph subscribers. Thank you for sticking with us, Telegraph subscribers. You're very, very welcome, certainly from a journalist's point of view. Um, thank you for Harper Collins for this evening. Thank you for the technical people who've made it all so perfect. And most importantly, Geoffrey's book is wonderful and it is available from all good booksellers, but particularly from Telegraph Books. What could be better? So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please join me in saying a really big thank you to Geoffrey Archer, Lord Archer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.